Great to have you with us. I see some returning uh, faces and names. Please introduce yourself over in the chat. Let us know where you're joining from today. Maybe let us know also if you were with us at the conference. I see several of you indicating that you were. Um, I know just from your names that I, I met some of you there last week in Scottsdale, Arizona. That is the topic for Next Practices Weekly today is key takeaways from the conference that we had last week. We've got a special guest in Elliot Maisie who's with us. I saw him jamming in the music. Thanks for the wave there, Elliot. We'll get to you in just a moment. For those of you that are new to this call series and maybe wondering what this is all about, we normally have guests who walk through their next practices at their organization. This week, it's a sort of a special session where we're going to be talking about our conference in Arizona last week. We're the Institute for Corporate Productivity. We're a human capital research firm. We discover the people practices that drive high performance. We define that through Four fairly common business terms, revenue growth, market share, profitability, and customer satisfaction through all of our studies. Uh, we highlighted a lot of our best and next practices from our research at our conference last week. Um, you see here a small sampling of our member organizations. We are a member-driven uh, research firm. You see they span all companies, large and small, across all different market verticals. Great to see so many of you here on the call today. Special welcome to our members. My name is Tom Stone. I'm a senior research analyst here at I4CP, and this week I'm joined by our CEO and co-founder, Mr. Kevin Oakes. Good morning, Kevin. Good morning, Tom. Good to have you with us. Uh, I know you're going to be able to share a lot of insights from your perspective on everything that went on last week in Arizona. Uh, coming up uh, next several weeks, we're not missing a beat. We've got guests from Allstate, Bank of Montreal, uh, one of our own, Rob Cross, uh, in the coming weeks, April 11th, 18th, and 25th. So just register, get these events on your calendar. If you miss one, we do record all of these sessions. They're available in our archive, so you can always go back and, and see what ones you've missed. We also do have Less less frequent, but uh, but periodic events for our colleagues in the APAC and EMEA regions, those in Asia, Europe, the Middle East. Um, these are not on at the same date and time. We we hold them at times more appropriate for folks in those time zones. Uh, so if you have colleagues uh, from those regions, uh, or maybe you're from that region yourself, um, be sure and register for that. It is a separate registration. You see the QR code there on the right. You can also just go to the website and register that way. Please share this with uh, your colleagues if you're a global firm uh, that are in those regions, because uh, again, we cover best and next practices uh, in HR uh, for folks in those regions. All right, let's get into it. We've got a lot to share today. Um, plenty more will be coming in forthcoming articles and videos and so on. Many of you that have been on these calls have seen this slide probably more than more than you've needed to. Uh, this is just a sampling of the great speakers we had at the conference. Um, it was our largest conference ever. Uh, Kevin, do you want to say a word on that? Uh, I think we broke our own records. Yeah, we did, Tom. And uh, you know, this is a, 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 an event that we at I4CP look forward to every year. And I know many of you on the line, many of our members do as well. Um, it's uh, a conference that we have been holding in Scottsdale, Arizona at the Fairmont for many years, uh, just a beautiful location. And what's unique about our conference is that we bring together probably the largest cadre of HR executives, certainly um, probably the most CHROs that attend uh, a conference like this each year. Um, but equally, it's important to note who we don't bring there. So we don't have any vendors or consultants at the conference. So it's a it's a real um, true peer sharing event. And I think that's one of the best parts of the conference, despite all those wonderful speakers that you showed, Tom. And we probably uh, had one of the best speaking lineups this year than we've ever had. Um, we, we really pride ourselves on the peer interactions that happen at the conference. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a very collegial event. So I, I, uh, I thought this year's event was um, just fantastic. Yeah, and one of those speakers, let me bring on uh, Elliot Maisie, who's the head of, of Maisie Learning and the Maisie Center. Uh, Elliot, uh, we're showing here the pictures of the 30-minute the sessions. Um, that was something that we consistently did this year. You were one of those speakers. Um, just at a high level, what, what, was your, what was your overall take on the event? Uh, what was, you know, I spend a lot of my time at conferences all around the world. It was a uniquely high trust environment. People were authentic because they weren't being pitched, they were sharing and they were really looking at variety of elements. They were curious, 
Um, and so many of the speakers didn't just go on the stage and evaporate, but were part of the environment. And uh, there were great conversations in the Q&A, and there were wonderful conversations later on, you know, at the coffee bar or, or, or the like. Uh, I came away, my brain is still spinning from, I think I took <laughs> uh, 26 pages of digital notes while nice. I was there. And my brain is still spinning from uh, the stuff. So congratulations. It really was a learning and research and colleague moment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah completely, I completely agree. Congratulations are probably in order too, Tom. Uh, we, we have to congratulate our conference team and all the employees at I4CP. Uh, it's not easy to put on an event this large, um, and we do it all internally. And and, and uh, I just really, you know, love the camaraderie that our team had in putting this event together. Just kudos to everybody who was involved with it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, double down on that. I wanted to note that there will be, in addition to this session, where we'll walk through just just a, a snippet of some of the highlights, really, because there was so much uh, that we could cover. We won't cover it all. There will be a series of articles, that's my understanding, from Human Resource Executive. Uh, one is already published uh, that you see here uh, just on April 2nd. Uh, we'll also be publishing our own articles and follow-ups. We're also hoping to get some of the speakers. We had four or five of our conference speakers on Next Practices Weekly here leading up to the conference, but I've I've earmarked several to, to pursue uh, for following the conference as well. We're, we're sort of booked out several months in advance for this call series, but I hope to get some of the folks that we'll be highlighting today uh, on for an, a more in-depth conversation as we, as we showed. They only had 30 minutes on the stage, Elliot and others. Uh, uh, that, that was by design. Uh, so hopefully we can get them for a little bit deeper conversation on some, some upcoming calls here. I wanted to start by noting that the Monday before the conference, so the conference ran Tuesday through sort of halfway through Thursday, two and a half full days of, of events. Um, but on the Monday, we had a full day for our I4CP executive level boards. Um, these met all day from eight to five and then had a dinner. You see the boards there on the right. We used to have six. We've added one, that one at the top, the Future of Work board. It's a brand new board for I4CP this year. Um, Kevin, do you want to say a little bit your perspective on, on, I know you were flitting from one room to the next, trying to see what was going on at all the boards. Uh, say a little bit more about that day. Well, the boards um, had a very active agenda, um, each and every one of them, and had guest speakers, um, some of whom were from our conference lineup, some of whom were brought in just for the board meetings. And so they all covered a variety of different topics. That future of work boards being led by uh, Karen Coker of Microsoft and uh, Mike Fenlon of uh, PwC. And they did a great job kicking that one off. So it was fun to just go from room to room and, and see some of the board members in action uh, and hear some of the topics that they were covering, because they're certainly very timely and, um, you know, uh, you know, very top initiatives for many of the companies that were there. And Elliot, I know you uh, not only presented uh, for your 30 minutes at, on the big stage at the at the conference proper, but you also presented to the Chief Learning and Talent Officer Board. And we'll get a snippet of, of what you shared with them a little bit later when we talk about AI. Um, but say a little bit more about your experience with that board. Well, once again, I thought I would do my, uh, you know, my presentation and leave. And uh, I was there <laughs> till 530. So uh, it was a intriguingly focused group that we're looking at, at a range of things of what does skills really mean? Uh, what does integration mean? Uh, how does talent fit in with the larger uh, world? And while we touched technology and it was really important, there was also a lot of conversation about um, trying to have a strategy. Uh, Kevin, building off of your work in culture and other elements to uh, really optimize what learning and talent development was about. And once again, people brought their honesty, their challenges, and even their failures to the uh, conversation. And it was Las Vegas rules, so not, not to share beyond that. Right. But the ahas were enormously valuable for me as a learner, and I believe for the, you know, the dozens of other people who were there. You, you mentioned taking so many notes throughout the week. Uh, Monday, the board meeting, I, I work with that board as well, the Chief Learning and Talent Officer Board. That was the day where I was getting tired typing up the notes rapidly from, from the great conversations we had. All right, let's dive into uh, our sort of... Uh, Blitz overview of some of the some just some of the presentations from the week. We we kick things off at the conference with an industry legend, really, 
Dave Ulrich. Um, and he started things off by noting uh, the, the change that we've seen in HR. And I just thought this was a very effective slide that he had showing two articles from the very same publication, Fast Company, showing the change uh, that we've seen over the years. Kevin, do you want to speak to this? <laughs> well, yeah, Dave was one of the real critics of that 2005 article, Why We Hate HR, uh, as was uh, our co-founder, Jay Jamrog. I think he was even quoted in the article. Um, so it was uh, it was certainly one that kind of woke up the industry. But I opened up by saying that one of the things I'm most proud about in the HR world is how much more strategic we are today than we were 20 years ago. It really has become a, a function that um, I think a lot of CEOs recognize is critical to make sure they have a uh, you know, a high performance organization overall. And I credit Dave with a lot of that. Dave has um, really helped make the HR um, function much more strategic over the years. And he backed that claim up as I introduced him uh, with, with this slide that you're showing now, Tom. Yeah, sort of the development. We we all remember the days, and whether it was our own work time or maybe our parents when HR was referred to as personnel department then it became human resources, got a little bit more thrown on its plate, human capital. And what Dave was really highlighting was its evolution into the sort of the human capability support department, enablement department, if you will. Uh, Elliot, any any thoughts on that as well? Yeah. And what, you know, he, uh, Dave's been one of my mentors over the, the decades. But, you know, what he was really saying is we've got to view it not as an internal infrastructure, you know, like, you know, the department that, that manages the elevators but rather to view it on a strategic level and something where the CEO and the C-level leaders can turn to HR and talent in order to adjust, tune, and optimize their, their organizations. And once again, uh, making sure there's an evidence base behind it. And, and it was wonderful to see how he brought together data and evidence to substantiate and, and point to where where uh, HR is, and even more importantly, where it's going in the next three years. Yeah. Well, that's well, a nice segue. Go ahead, Kevin. I was going to say, what I appreciate about Dave is he's a, not just a deep HR thinker, he's a deep business thinker and has great financial acumen and really great understanding of business, as do most of the top uh, HR leaders that we work with out in the industry. And I think that's one of the big changes that we've seen over the years is just how how uh, deep, deeply embedded in the business many of these top HR leaders have become. And the other thing that I think is um, uh, tough to appreciate about Dave, if you don't travel abroad, he's maybe more popular in Europe and Asia than he is here mm -hmm. in the US. Uh, and it's really uh, interesting to talk to um, large companies um, overseas and hear them say, we're following the Ulrich model for our HR organization. And that, that's the kind of impact he's had on the whole profession. Wow, I didn't I didn't realize that. That that's very interesting to hear because he certainly is well known in the U.S. as well. Um, that's a good segue. Both of you mentioned the connection to the business and to top top CEOs. I mean, we're well past the days of HR trying to fight for just a seat at the table. Um, we had several CEOs. I've highlighted two of them here as speakers at the conference: Hubert Jolie and Oscar Munoz, uh, and also Diane Gerson, who's the former CHRO at IBM and now uh, on several companies' boards of directors. So between CEOs and boards of directors, HR has much greater influence now than it did in the past. Kevin, you in particular uh, were had the fireside chats with Hubert and Oscar. What are some highlights there? Yeah, we kicked things off with uh, Oscar Munoz, and um, he's a really, really interesting individual. He's just a, a very gregarious guy who um, had a very tumultuous uh, start to his CEO ship of United. He came in at a very tough time. He was on the board of directors there and uh, United uh, was not doing well. And he was asked essentially to come in and help turn around the company, uh, which he did and is the background for his book, Turnaround Time. But in the process, he went through a, a major, uh, major health issue where he had a heart attack and, and eventually had a heart transplant. And he talks quite openly about that and trying to help others understand, you know, some of the symptoms and, uh, you know, what to look for um, in that regard. He recovered from that in record time. In fact, he holds the record for a person of his age recovering from a heart transplant, which doesn't shock me at all after getting to know him a bit. 
Um, and more importantly, he just talked about leading with empathy throughout the organization and how he did that um, uh, in his tenure at United. I can tell you firsthand, when I was talking to United employees, when Oscar was the CEO, he was absolutely beloved while he was there. And uh, they, they could not say more good things about him. So that was a that was a fun conversation. And just hearing Oscar's viewpoint, I think, on people and how important they are to, uh, you know, to the, uh, you know, financial performance of the organization. Elliot, was there anything you took away from uh, Oscar's presentation? No, once again, it was, you know, that, that concept that empathy isn't a squishy thing. It's actually a strategic element. Uh, it isn't yeah. therapy. It isn't condolence. But rather, it is is an operational connection to employees and to your customers. And he said it well. And you bear in a very similar way talked about the uh, the heart of the business has to be in your heart, surrounded by data and surrounded by operational elements. But I love when we've uh, moved beyond empathy being a soft skill, but rather a part of what we do to lead organizations and keep them healthy and sustainable. Yeah. I, I had spent some time talking with Oscar uh, ahead of the conference, so I knew him a little bit, but I didn't know Hubert as well before the conference. And now I feel like uh, we're best buds. He's um, Hubert is a very uh, interesting leader. And I agree with you. He carried through that theme of empathy and how he was leading Best Buy. Um, he equally did a great turnaround story. Best Buy could have become, you know, just one of many big box retailers that went by the wayside, right? And uh, Elliot, you, you've you known Hubert for quite longer than I have. And I remember having a conversation. He says, we're not going to go blockbuster, you know, meaning big store function, but rather we are going to hone in. And uh, I've known him. He is now considering an amazing reputation uh, developing leaders and CEOs uh, in his role at Harvard, and he and his uh, his wife, who is also one of our speakers, uh, are coaches as well, because he really wants to work one to one with that senior leader. And you could feel you could feel that connection on the stage from from Hubert. What I thought it was great about Hubert and his wife Hortense. They um, uh, they were at the uh, conference the entire time that uh, he he was there. They uh, they went to all the events. They they listened to all the you know this the talks, and it was fun just kind of sitting next to him and hearing his reaction to some of the you know some of what he was hearing. He was just so impressed with all the speakers and uh, so appreciative of the human capital function overall. So uh, they both have books that are out, uh, Hubert and, and Oscar. Uh, those are available, of course, on Amazon. So I'd encourage you, if you want to learn more about their stories, to check out their books. We also did a, a pre-conference session of Next Practices Weekly with Oscar. So that is archived up on our website. You can learn more about him. And I'm hoping to maybe get Hubert on, on a call. Uh, his wife, Hortons, also a speaker at the conference. We already had a session with her. So that's also archived up on our site. Let's move along and talk a little bit about HR's interaction with boards of directors. That's what Diane's excellent presentation was on. And I want to bring up some data um, that we that we gathered, you know, well before the conference. On the left here, you see um, the typical human capital data that is already shared. You see pretty high numbers there with boards of directors at organizations. So diversity of leadership being number one, leadership bench succession number two, and you see on down the list. But then more interestingly on the right, these are the cap human capital data items not typically shared. You see the much lower numbers there, um, but the directors view as valuable. And and uh, Diane really spoke to this, these data points in, in her presentation. Kevin, what would you what would you add on this key point? Well, let, let me let's talk about Diane first. Diane is um, just a remarkable leader. She um, uh, was head of talent at IBM and then was promoted. Uh, to CHRO at IBM and uh, just did some marvelous things uh, in both roles when she was there. And she's continued that um, with the boards that she's on now. And I I had this conversation with Hubert and Oscar as well, and they all, they all agree that we need more human capital expertise on board of directors, um, certainly for public boards. Uh, most boards have sort of over-architected on financial acumen and strategic acumen. Uh, but had very little human capital acumen, and the, the pandemic uh, exposed that a bit. And I think more and more companies are recognizing they need to add that. And I think Diane's a great example of where she's brought that to the boards that she's on. 
And as you look at you know some of these um, uh, human capital data points uh, here on this slide, it's obvious that we've got a long way to go to get to you know some of the the more strategic things that we really want to talk about versus just the risk averse things um, you know that uh, boards are looking at from a human capital perspective. Uh, Elliot, you've known Diane for a while. I'd love to get your thoughts. Well, what she brings, and she, I knew her at IBM, and and what, what Diane brings is this idea that when you're on a board, and I've had the honor of being on some boards, um, you're there in case of an emergency, and you're there to stamp the process. But she really talks about courage, and that you want to have a board that's courageous, but really, without evidence, without data, it's very difficult. So literally looking at one of the numbers that Tom shared, you know, of looking at who's leaving or, or what is the promotion rate, and then having the courage to bring things up before their crisis, but could be a vector. And uh, I think she uh, illustrates that extremely well. And it's often not the CEO that's blocking it, but sometimes it's the intermediate staff who uh, have a very classical view of the slide deck that the board should get. And uh, I used to, when I was on the board and she would laugh at this, is you've got to ask them to leave the room and you ask what's keeping you up at night. And when you get to that and you get to that data, you get to courage. And I think that's an important, critical piece. And uh, once again, where most of these data points that are talent and HR data points will, will pop up and be valued. And I'll, I'll add culture to that as well, Elliot. And I think Diane did a great job in her presentation using examples that I often use and I actually wrote about in uh, Culture Renovation, uh, where certain uh, companies uh, re really ran afoul because of the culture that they allowed to, um, you know, fester uh, underneath. So, you know, and, and some of these companies are still wrestling with these issues. So Boeing is one of them, certainly still wrestling with these issues. But she talked about Wells Fargo. She talked about Volkswagen. She talked about you know, numerous other organizations where culture has played a big role in some of the issues that those companies have had. And so she's a big proponent of making sure that the board is aware of some of the underlying cultural elements and looking at culture measures uh, overall. We still have a long way to go in this industry at measuring culture, uh, but it's imperative for senior leadership teams uh, and for boards to really take a look at, uh, you know, what is happening with the underlying culture. And, and just, you know, literally based on the slide that Tom has up here, most boards have financial fluency. They know how to ask finance. When you move into the talent HR area, they don't often have that fluency. Mm -hmm. So to talk about managerial capability or retention or, or even lately the, the concept that you have people who want mobility rather than promotion. And so it is enormously important that I believe that rising HR folks as one of their career objectives, should have, where appropriate, a non-conflicting role in a, another board where they can bring that, that asset to that. And I think they bring that experience back to their current role as well. Yep. Yeah, these questions that are on the screen, these are ones that from Diane's deck that, that, she, that she shared with us from her experience serving on Kraft Heinz's board, but several others as well at this point in her career. So great stuff that she shared at the conference. And thank you, Zeta. Zeta has been putting in the chat some of the links to some of the folks that we've already had on Next Practices Weekly that are available in the archive, those recordings, including the chat we had with Diane, where she not only spoke on this topic, but AI and a few others as well. So if you'd like to learn more from her, definitely check out that recording. Speaking of AI, this was uh, the, the topic that we, not surprisingly, had the most sessions on. If you think back to the conference last year, you know, ChatGPT had only been made public for four or five months at that point. So we, we were certainly talking about it. But by now, we've all had close to a year and a half working with it and, and other, uh, other AI you know, tools of that kind, generative AI in particular. So we made sure to cover it from as many angles as possible. You see here uh, the many speakers uh, and, the, and the various angles. So we had Amy Coleman, uh, a, a VP from Microsoft, share what they've been doing with AI. Uh, we had Prasad Seti, formerly from Google, Charlene Lee, who's authored many, many books in, in HR and leadership, 
um, Elliot, yourself, and we'll get to some of your insights here in just a moment. The shortest uh, title for a session at the entire conference was Cameron Hedrick, the Chief Learning Officer at City, who had a two-word title, Proxy Me. And I'm just gonna I'm just gonna throw that out there for now. We won't say too much about it unless unless Kevin wants to jump in. I'm hoping to get Cameron on as a guest here on Next Practices Weekly because it's such an interesting sort of hacking concept that he did. So I'm just gonna tease that up for now. We had Monica Poole Knox, uh, former CHRO at multiple organizations, talking about how the, the role of the CHRO itself needs to change given AI. That's how broad sweeping it is. And then a sort of surprise, uh, pr provocative speaker, I thought, Matt Bean, um, on, on what he called his book, The Skill Code. And we'll, we'll touch on that here in just a moment. But if I could set things up a little further on AI, this is from um, uh, the Microsoft speaker, Amy Coleman's uh, slide deck. Just showing how quickly, this was very impactful for me. Mobile phones sort of took 16 years to reach 100 million users. You see internet was less than half that, Facebook around half that. But then look at the near vertical line for ChatGPT. In three months, that's how quickly we got to 100 million users. Couple of other good data points here. 70% uh, of CEOs agree that Gen AI will significantly change the way their company creates, delivers, and captures value, a very broad unit there in three years. And then, But then, on the other hand, only 16% of corporate board directors are very confident that management is articulating a vision about how Gen AI may uh, impact the company. So broad impact, according to CEOs, um, but, uh, but not ready for it in many ways, according to corporate board directors. K.O., anything else you'd, you'd like to say? And then and then I'm going to bring up Elliot's slide here next. Well, we, we could probably spend half a day just talking about um, the, what, what we learned in these presentations because there was so much great info. And although they all had the general theme of Gen AI, it was amazing how each presentation um, looked at it very differently, right, and took different uh, different angles to it. Um, I'll uh, I'll comment on Matt Bean. He's probably the least famous person out of uh, all those people that were up there, but uh, he was very provo provocative and got a lot of people really thinking about: um, Are is the learning industry really suffering um, because of robotics and AI right now? And he used uh, an example really from the robotics industry and surgery. And while we're using a lot more robots in surgery these days, uh, the, the detriment to that is our surgeons are becoming less skilled because they're just not experiencing it firsthand. And so uh, he called that, that out as a, a major issue, right, that, uh, yeah. that that industry has to look at. And you could extrapolate that to, you know, many other, you know, areas of automation. Um but yeah, yeah, Cameron's proxy me uh, presentation was very eye opening. So that'll be great to have him on. But a lot of this really fed into Elliot what you were talking about um, as as part of uh, your keynote and how is AI really changing the learning uh, function? And you know what what we have to hear and we heard it from all the speakers that are there. We can spend a lot of time studying the tech, and you need to be comfortable around it. You need to be modestly fluent. But really the value as an HR talent leader that you bring is not the tech, but how does the tech optimize something in business? And I threw out a few ideas about what is it optimizing learning? Good example, I had a number of people leading the Marines in learning and they showed up for a conversation around AI and learning and their number one thing they wanted to deal with was personalization. They felt that they don't wanna spend weeks, dollars, and energy on things the person already knows or doesn't need to know yet. So how do we deal with the personalization enormously? So, so we start to think, and these are some different elements of not what the AI is. And I even think eventually we're going to talk about AI more submerged and all over the place. But what does it do to a process, whether it's optimizing the learner, optimizing the learning delivery, optimizing the work? So in some cases, you know, we'll look at uh, computer programmers who, who write code, their jobs are going to be radically different. They're not going away, but they're going to be radically different. But what about teaching somebody something that has nothing to do with code? How will we get to a point where they will be smart tutors, uh, mm -hmm. prompting them with workflow support? Uh, we think there's going to be assessment, simulation, uh, impact tracking. How do we really know that onboarding? What impact does it have on retention? You know, how can we track that through? 
And um, I, I had some fun. I'm, I'm wearing my Wicked uh, shirt. I, I use the theme of defying gravity because on one level, you can be really respectful as, as I am and we all are about AI, but I'm not sure you want to become a fanboy fangirl of that, meaning you want to be somebody who can defy gravity. Look at what it can do, honor what it can do, and then how does it integrate with human intelligence? And so we even looked at the fact your learners or your employees, they're going to be using AI that has nothing to do with what you implemented. And we're going to have to figure out uh, what are the legal issues? What are the standards around that? What are the ethics of that? And I love the stuff you've done, Kevin and Tom, uh, in terms of providing some uh, handbook visions for people in this in this field. Because guess what, gang? We are going to be experimenters. We are going to have to experiment our way. And that's what Cameron, will, when, when you reveal that at one point, uh, I think you look for some interesting areas to say, could I get an aha? Could I get an oh, wow? Could I try something and even fail our way forward in that? But yeah, so optimize things by looking at AI as a potential optimizer. And I, I love that Elliot's always experimenting. Uh, we've been friends for probably over 25 years, and I've seen Elliot present hundreds of times. This is the first time I saw Elliot sing on stage, and uh, I'm, I'm kind of hoping it's the last, but it was very entertaining, Elliot, so thank you. I defy in gravity. That's Elliot, uh, <laughs> Elliot is uh, is usually uh, in front of the stage. Uh, for those that don't know him, he's a very well known and successful Broadway producer. So he he doesn't just talk about Broadway and integrate it into into his talks. But between Kinky Boots and many other plays that that you would recognize, he's been involved as a producer of them. Um, so always fascinating to hear your insights when you can integrate those in. And I got to draw attention to the photo here. Uh, I did not Photoshop this. Elliot is famous for wearing a different colored sport coat to each of his. He's led many, many conferences over the years. Uh, how many total different colors do you have? I'd put it at over a dozen, I assume. Oh, it's what there's a, a tailor in Hong Kong. I send them a uh, a PMS color patch and I get a, a jacket. Patch. <laughs> nice. Very good. All right. Um, we, we already touched on Matt Bean's interesting presentation, but just wanted to hit on it again. Um, it, as Kevin described, it was a healthcare example of surgeons um, not, uh, you know, sort of favoring productivity and maybe sacrificing learning for those up and coming surgeons. So, yes, it can help in the short term, the surgeon do something more efficiently, do something better. I remember a study of radiologists a few years ago that uh, AI was able to, uh, let's see, the radiologist on their own was able to detect, let's say, 92% of tumors of a certain kind. Um, uh, the AI was able to detect 95%, but the two working together was were able to detect 98%. So, that, you know, it, it was, it, it, it's the two working together that's most important. And, and that was a big part of Matt's message here. And, and as Kevin said, he gave the example from surgery, but then he had a slide with like 20 other professions where the same thing comes up. Uh, and it, it was just very interesting. This book is is coming out very soon. Uh, so you, you'll want to check that out. It's called The Skill Code. Yeah. And Tom, uh, one of the things you can think about as well is the difference between competency and wisdom. So I can be competent to do something, but am I wise enough to figure out what to do when something goes wrong? Right. And one of the things that happens when we get highly automated is that the human being relies on the wisdom of the system. And I actually think we have to make sure that we stretch the wisdom of the system, but more importantly, that we stretch the agility and the wisdom of the practitioner in there as well. I, I've already somewhat witnessed that, Elliot, and I, and I think we'll witness this more going forward where people are using ChatGPT to do research for them or what have you. But, you know, when they come back with the, the results and you ask a simple question, what does that mean? And then people don't know. Well, I don't know if Jeff, yeah. GPT says it's right, you know, so it must be, you know, and that that's the the fallacy uh, aspect that I think we're going to fall into here. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to share this very, very quickly. Uh, a, you'll be able to grab it if you download the slide deck from today's session. It's a useful slide uh, just to wrap up this, this bit on Gen AI. 
This is a slide that your format, at least, that you're going to see more and more from, from I4CP. We're going to be applying our, our five domains of high performance, uh, market, strategy, culture, leadership, and talent to a broad range of areas in, in human capital and providing you one or two questions for each. So this is just an example of this kind of format you see, you know, for say, for culture. Will our culture enable or impede our strategic plans for Gen, I, Gen AI? Will it embrace or resist the AI talent that we'll need to bring aboard? Um, and you see there's there's a couple of questions for each of these domains. So Kevin, anything you wanna say on this? I know it's based on, on decades old research, our people profit chain. Yeah, well, it, and it's really based on, uh, as the title says here, the five domains, which we organize all our research under right now as part of our membership. So I, I love the, um, the way we've got it in sort of a linear format. Uh, you know, ultimately resulting in productivity and performance. And uh, I think it's a good framework to use for a lot of different topics, but certainly Gen, Gen AI is the top one right now. Yeah. All right. Uh, we're going to keep moving along here because there was certainly plenty more besides the CEO and board conversations and AI that were discussed at the conference. One big one also was diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, which we'll get to specifically one organization that we partner with on that front in a moment. Uh, but the message here was that DE&I is hard work. We had a, several sessions. I'm highlighting two of them here. One was a panel with folks from Choice Hotels, Amentum, and Publicis Group. Uh, and then another was uh, an interview that our colleague, Lori Likens, VP of Research, had with Dr. Tina Opie from Babson College on her work, her book, Sister Shared Sisterhood. Um, Kevin, uh, I'm going to share a couple of data points here in a moment, but what are your thoughts from these two sessions in particular? Um, I, I opened the conference talking about DE&I um, and added accessibility because we, lately we've been adding that. I think it's an important one to add. Um, and just uh, expressing some dismay over the backlash around DEI these days. It's um, really um, somewhat surprising if you go back three years uh, in the months following George Floyd's murder, uh, there was tremendous support uh, for DEI initiatives and, and a lot of financial support. Companies poured billions into programs and, and uh, pledged billions uh, for DEI. And you know, here we are three short, short years later and uh, DEI has become one of the harder jobs uh, in organizations. So I, I wanted to um, more than anything, just applaud the hard work of the DEI professionals that we work with that were in the audience because it really has become a hard job. You see here, one of the data points from one of our surveys we had asked, um, you know, is uh, have you made progress uh, even with the DE&I backlash. And I saw a question earlier from Alessandria in the chat on that. And so this definitely was a topic at the conference. Good to see that, that so many organizations have made progress, 75% saying yes. But then we also asked, what are the, the main sources of challenges? And while external critics and, and things outside the organization, one quarter did say that that's a major challenge, it was interesting finding that managers and frontline workers often are resistant in imposing a challenge. Uh, any any comments on that, Kevin? Yeah, in fact, um, Fortune Magazine puts out a, a newsletter each day called CHRO Daily. And uh, this is the subject of this morning's um, CHRO Daily, uh, where the reporter and I talked about um, how the challenges that some of those professionals are facing are coming from inside, um, you know, just as much as they're coming from outside or even more than outside. And I think it's just really following society. I think we have, uh, you know, some... Uh, you know, opposing viewpoints on this subject. And I think people are taking cues from leaders, um, you know, out, out in uh, political parties, obviously, in, in the world. And uh, I think what we're seeing inside an organization is that HR and DEI in particular are having to deal with these issues, you know, and having to deal with these challenges um, um, amongst the workforce. The good news is, as your previous slide showed, Tom, is I think they're more than capable of dealing with these and they're doing a great job at continuing to push forward with what uh, they had initially set out to, to uh, accomplish. Also, uh, say a little bit about this. This was prior to the conference, a uh, pretty big event for I4CP and our Chief Diversity Officer Board. Yeah, um, we, um, we brought 40 uh, plus HR executives to the White House in February. Uh, for a meeting with the administration, we had a half-day meeting around some of the challenges that DEI is facing. 
And it was um, from both sides, I think, a great conversation. Um, the administration wanted to know what are corporations doing uh, with DEI programs today, given the backlash. And equally, corporations wanted to know what the administration was doing and, and what the viewpoints were. Um, this is something that we expect to continue. Uh, you'll notice we blurred out all the faces of people that were there. We didn't want anybody having a Bud Light moment uh, just because they attended the meeting. Um, and I joke that I'm the only one not blurred out. So if I'm not around next year, you'll know why. Um, but, uh, you know, it was, it was it's something that I, um, I'm hoping we can continue. And uh, it's not just with the White House or the administration. It's also with the EEOC and other uh, um, areas of government as well. And then I uh, called out the, the addition of accessibility, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. Um, I4CP is proud to have long been a promoter and sponsor of Best Buddies, uh, an organization that benefits uh, those with intellectual disabilities and getting them both more educational opportunities, more workplace opportunities in particular. You see some of the benefits there. Uh, we did a study called the Inclusive Talent Pool, actually two studies, that's the more recent one, um, really showing the benefits to businesses and hiring people with IDD. Um, we always have a speaker at the conference uh, representing the organization to, to talk about what they do. And we also do a friendship walk early in the morning. So it's, it's maybe not for everyone, but you see a lot of people turned out early in the morning for that friendship walk. This is the picture from this year's event. Uh, I think it's as, as big of a, a turnout as we've ever had. Uh, more you want to say about Best Buddies and, and their uh, their work with us? Yeah, well, first of all, look at all those people uh, in a you know, big virtual round of applause to all those people because they showed up at 6.15 a.m. Uh, after we had a big blowout party the night before to do this walk uh, to support Best Buddies. And we have been supporting this organization for many years. And it's really thanks to Madeline Borkin, who's uh, uh, our head of membership development. Um, she uh, got us involved with Best Buddies uh, over a decade ago. And it's just fun to support uh, this group. And each year we have um, you know, great presence um, by Best Buddies at our conference. Elliot, uh, any, any thoughts? Uh, one thing I wanted to know, you talked about the importance of empathy earlier. Um, and uh, I, know, I wanted to know you've done a series of empathy concerts uh, with, with your connections from Broadway over the years. So I wanted to just note that. I don't know if any of those are archived and available for people to go back and see or if you've got more planned. But oh, well, beyond that, what, what are your thoughts on, on DE&I and related topics? Well, I think, and you know, I want to give kudos to, to you, Kevin. Uh, you talked about it in a direct way. You know, very often people are afraid to talk about things that are direct and other people may perceive as political. You know, I don't have a problem talking about today's the anniversary when Martin Luther King was was killed. You know, that's not political. That's part of our history. And Kevin, I, I really respect that you frame this out. Uh, we are probably in this political year. There's going to be so much sort of turbulence around there, but we can't sacrifice what our values are. And DEI is not a political position. It's a value position. It's a language. You know, I shared with you, I like to think of what are our Statue of Liberty values? You know, what right. are the things so, that they stand for? And so one of the things we may need to do from an empathy point of view is play with our language, not with our positions, but with our language to find what the safe, the safe conversation spaces are in that and, uh, and, and not sacrifice our values there. Um, the, the world is going there and we have to make sure our workplaces go there with the world because that's that's the way towards profitability, sustainability. All of your measures happen when we really do embrace what the culture of our of, of our society can be. Yeah. Well, well said. said. Well yeah. said. All right, uh, let's move on. We've got a couple other topics that I wanted to share that were important at the conference. One really briefly for now, because we'll hit on it in a separate session in the months to come. Our, our colleague, Rob Cross, who, uh, professor at Babson College, SVP now of research at I4CP, gave a talk um, sort of uh, unveiling some of our latest research on high performance teams, what makes them truly effective. A lot has changed. Uh, this wasn't the same old, same old uh, you know, best practices of, of effective teams that could have been presented five or 10 years ago. A lot has changed since the pandemic and the shift to hybrid and remote work uh, and just learning more about what makes for effective teams. A couple of quick data points on this. Um, 
Uh, 39% uh, from the study found productivity loss across organizations due to teams not collaborating effectively. That's a significant productivity loss attributed to one element, teams not, not collaborating effectively. Four out of five, 80% of teams struggling with dysfunctional patterns of collaboration. And Rob's great at going through and detailing six different patterns and, 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 and you know, how they're structured and why they're each a problem. And then a massive delta here, six time, 16x least effective teams are 16 times more likely to not engage in, in, in external collaborative practices. Um, Rob is always a whirlwind of knowledge whenever he gets on stage and condensed into 30 minutes, it was probably even more so than usual. Uh, Kevin, what are your initial thoughts as, as we start to roll out more from our team effectiveness study? It, it, you know, people have been researching teams for a while, but I think we really haven't cracked the code and, and probably are still scratching the surface here on what we could do with team effectiveness. Um, we spend a lot of time uh, managing the individual performance of employees in an organization. And even though those individuals spend most of their time on teams and multiple teams uh, throughout the workday, we, we spend very little time managing team performance. And so this was a, um, a great study. I'm looking forward to it actually being published. It's, it's not published yet. We were just giving some preliminary info uh, that both Catherine Brecken on our research team and Rob are, are uh, spearheading to take a look at how do we elevate that bottom quartile of teams? If we can get that bottom quartile to be more productive, what a, uh, what a boost that will be to almost any organization. And a big part of it is looking at the network effect here and what is what is the uh, collaboration patterns of the uh, people on these teams and how it impacts productivity as your stats are showing. Yeah, absolutely. So there'll be the, the full report, I believe, due out in May for members. There will be uh, some some assets that will be available to the broader public. And as I said, we'll have both Rob and Catherine on next practices weekly, probably over the summer sometime to really dig in into the details here. All right, another big topic like AI, like DE and I uh, was uh, culture and leadership and, and sort of the interconnection between the two. They're both big topics on their own, uh, but I grouped these five presenters together. Uh, Ian Wilson from Amazon, Stacy Hoyne from Guardian. Uh, we mentioned earlier Hortons, uh, Hubert Jolie's wife, uh, who we also had as a guest, and we've already provided the link to her session uh, from a few weeks ago here on Next Practices Weekly. She's the author of a great new book, The Unlocked Leader. Um, we had Stephanie Kramer on, on admittedly something that's sort of a, a niche topic, but women in the workplace who are, are pregnant and about to go on maternity leave and, and the power that they bring and, and how they need to navigate uh, issues around pregnancy at work. Uh, she's the CHRO at L'Oreal USA. And then we had Professor Bob Sutton from Stanford University. Um, Great, great set of speakers here. As I said, both Hortons and Ian as well have already been guests on Next Practices Weekly. I'm hoping to get Stephanie as a guest because I think that topic of pregnancy at work is, is a great one and her presentation was very powerful. So hopefully we can get her on a call coming up soon. Kevin and Elliot, um, what were some of your takeaways from these speakers? Well, one well, other thing. Oh, go ahead, Kevin. You first. Yeah. I was just going to build on uh, what you just said about Stephanie. Um, she has a new book out um, by that same title. So uh, I encourage people, just like we've done uh, with some other speakers, to go out and, and get her book. Um, but a uh, very powerful presentation, um, and, and I'm looking forward to you having her on uh, Next Practices Weekly, Tom. Yeah. Go, go ahead, Elliot. I'll let you. Uh... Well, I, I had a conversation, actually, with a few of these folks. But once again, a lot of people stayed around, and we had some great one-to-ones. Uh, and somebody was asking somebody, well, culture, is, is, it, is it the image? Is it the statement? Is it the paragraph and three of them came back and said no it's it's the architecture you would and and they use an example you might have an image of a house but you're not going to build a house just by putting wood around at some point you want a blueprint and that blueprint creates an archaeology and that archaeology then becomes the culture of how that house is built and in that same way let's move away from thinking about things like culture and even leadership as i hate the word soft soft skills, soft interventions. No, no, it's it's fundamental to the, the structure of the organization. And they each brought wonderful elements to it. You know, and uh, I thought it was great the way Stephanie uh, made it very personalized in talking about pregnancy and what that means in terms of navigation and, and the like. And, and, you know, each of them 
is business focused and realizes that business success, the route there is with culture and leadership. And it was it was a five sided wow for me. <laughs> I thought Stacy did a great job in talking about the culture renovation that Guardian has gone through. It's a very old company, but uh, she she did a wonderful job just talking about how she's been part of their culture change. And, you know, it's always fascinating to have somebody like Ian uh, from Amazon uh, speaking because Amazon's the third largest employer in the entire world. And some of the issues that they deal with are unfathomable to most companies. Uh, but Ian, who runs HR for over half of the organization, probably more than half the organization, uh, has just been really focused on how do we create a culture that, you know, sustainable long term. And, uh, you know, the you know, a lot of times it's easy for people to kind of pick on Amazon's culture just because we're all so familiar with the company. Um, but given how big that workforce is, you just can't even imagine some of the issues that they have to go through. Absolutely. So again, we've had a few of these folks as guests. I'm, I'm going to particularly push to get Stephanie on as a guest coming up and, and we'll go after Stacy and Bob as well. Really, uh, you know, the majority of the speakers we had at the conference were outstanding speakers and, and we hope to get them on next practices weekly uh, coming up in the summer and fall. Yeah. And I don't want just... to. Oh, I'm glad you had this slide. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah. Or... Just wanted to know Bob Sutton's uh, presentation as well. Again, a book author, um, his, his session title is the same as the book titled Friction Project. Um, and he really honed in on, on making sure that, that leaders, uh, you know, make the right things easier and the wrong things harder, as he says. You want to comment further on that, Kevin? No, I was. I, I didn't want to leave that slide without talking about Bob because he was our, our uh, cleanup uh, hitter, if you will. He was the last speaker and uh, just did a great job getting people to think about how to create the you know, the right type of friction. In fact, I've even had uh, people in, in I4CP say, I want to do that in my own little department. Um, Ellie, you've known Bob for a while. I mean, he's just a, a really interesting professor from Stanford. Yeah, and, and once again, he has a pragmatic approach about this. This isn't a highfalutin theory. It's what do you pragmatically do as a leader, as, as a manager in that, in that sense? And not, once again, we have so much, we have so much emphasis on feedback being part of development, but sometimes we don't really talk about how we hone that, you know, and I love what what he goes is that you really need to do some differentiation between what are the right things, what are the wrong things, how do we how do we make those differentiations and adjustments? And it's great, great, great person and great book to get. All right. Well, looking at the time, we've only got six minutes left. I'm going to very quickly wrap by noting. Uh, each year at the conference, we also give out our Next Practices Awards. Um, you see there uh, what, what, why we do that, um, looking for things where organizations have had significant ROI from a practice in their organization, creating uh, powerful new approaches uh, to support employees during times of disruption and so on. I want to give a plug for next year. Uh, we're already accepting uh, ad, uh, submissions for the Next Practice Awards for 2025's conference. Just go to i4cp.com forward slash Next Practice Awards. Um, Wanted to just quickly run through uh, who the award winners were this year. These are the many finalists that we had for the overall Next Practice Award winning organizations. Amongst these, the five winners were Mondelez International, Pinterest, Toyota, City, and Intuit. And you see there the names for uh, some other programs. These also, I think, are great organizations to bring on Next Practice Weekly in the coming weeks and months to highlight some of these programs. We've already had uh, the, the CHRO from Pinterest to PinFlex, uh, their program uh, as a guest, but we'll try and get these others here lined up soon. I think City is the next one up, uh, AI readiness and HR agility. Uh, we'll be highlighting uh, that organization and that practice coming up soon. We also had some interesting awards and Kevin, maybe I'll let you speak to these three first for some individuals. Well, we started giving out an Industry Legend Award uh, a few years ago, and it was an easy one this year to give it to Dave. Um, and, you know, I, I had commented earlier just how important he's been to our industry. Uh, Cameron, who we've talked about quite a bit, um, he uh, was our board member of the year. Um, Cameron's just uh, done uh, you know, a great job of contributing to the Chief Learning and Talent Officer Board. 
um, and supporting that board over time. And then and similarly, Jennifer Weber uh, uh, is our CHRO of the year. She's on our CHRO board and uh, has been hosting some meetings in the Chicago uh, upper Midwest area uh, for us. And uh, just really appreciate all she's done to support I4CP. And then we also had a few other organizational awards. Target got the overall member of the year award, Google the high performance award, PAX 8 culture renovation award, Scripps uh, community member of the year award. We're not just a research organization, obviously as shown by this conference, but also all of our exchanges, boards, flash calls, and in and, and this call series, uh, so much of the value from I4CP comes from leaning into the community that we've created. And lastly, John Deere, the new member of the year award. Uh, any any further thoughts on these, Kevin? I just want to thank our awards committee. We had a number of people um, who had to go through all of the different submissions, and they and they spent a lot of time on this, and we get a lot of submissions. So thanks to all of them for their hard work. All right. Well, we're going to wrap at this point. Um, by announcing, as we did at the conference, that next year's conference, instead of at the end of March, will be at the beginning of March. So pencil this or pen this into your calendar already. March 3rd through the 6th, 2025 will be the 2025 Next Practices Now conference. Uh, Kevin will be there. Elliot, I hope you'll be back as well. Elliot has a, a perennial invitation to our conference. So. <laughs> Great, great to have you both with us sharing your insights. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, and as always, just want to wrap by noting uh, that all Next Practices Weekly uh, events uh, like this one are available for recertification credit hours. Just jot down the relevant program ID or activity ID if that applies to you. Uh, thank you, Zeta, for also putting those over in the chat. Um, and that's it for today. Um, thanks, everyone. Thank you again, Elliot, for being with us. An honor, an honor.